continue in Ephesians into the last chapter, chapter 6. We'll look at the first nine verses this morning. Paul has been writing about submission. In chapter 6, he continues that thought, or in, he's already given instructions back in chapter 5. Wife is to submit to her husband as unto the Lord. They are to follow the will of their loving husband, husband before they follow their own will, but again, as to the Lord. Husbands, well, we're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And remember, he died for the church. We're to place her needs before our own, as Christ did for the church. Now, as Christians, we voluntarily submit we place ourselves under the authority of Christ, and we have a place to fill, a position to fill, or a rank to potasso. We need to stay in our lines, so to speak, as Christians and as human beings. Now, if every Christian did as God's Word tells us to in this world, well, we wouldn't be talking about <laughs> Afghanistan, would we? We wouldn't have to worry about a lost soul. We wouldn't be concerned with our government, the fighting and bickering that takes place, not just in the government, but all around us. Because the churches will be overflowing with people wanting to learn more about God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Bible. But we all fall short, don't we? We fall short, we try, we mess up, but that's not to be an excuse. We're not to say, well, I tried. I'd serve as a Sunday school teacher. I'd serve on this committee, but I'm just gonna fall short. Don't do that. You're going to fall short. We all fall short. As a pastor, I have fallen short many a times. But I gotta get back up with God's help and keep moving forward and that's what we all have to do and when we fall short let it be an encouragement to get up and serve God his way Paul's instruction to Christians today is, is all about how to walk in a manner worthy of being called a Christian of being called a Christ follower and we need to be consistent in our lives, not one way at home, one way at church. We need to be consistent as we live our lives before others. So today, we're going to look at, as a title of the message, our goals. I'll give you three goals for Christians. All of them are saying, as unto the Lord, rank under him in the manner in which we're supposed to. So he's talked about the wife, he's talked about the husband, and today, children. We see in 6, 1 through 3, children are to obey their parents. You know, it's sad for my generation of being a child to children I see today. This is not true for all, but it seems like more children are running the parents or obeying the, the parents are obeying the children instead of the children obeying the parents. That's not the case for all, but I see it. When you're in, let's just say Walmart, and you're near the toy section, and the kid's throwing a fit and saying, I want this toy! And the parent goes, no! But they buy it anyway. You see it. I've seen it. Children are to obey their parents. Why? If we look at verse, chapter 6, verse 1. Children obey your parents in the Lord, this is right. God says it's right. Then he, he's quoting really from Exodus, from the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that, you, so that it may all be, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long <laughs> on the earth. What does that mean? Well. Let's talk about a child that doesn't obey their parents. A child that they get to be 
They don't even have to be a teenager anymore. They get to the attitude because it's what all their friends are saying. Mom and dad know nothing. Come on to the party. Take a drink. Try this drug. It'll make you feel better. You know, we've got so many children and teenagers nowadays that are depressed. Depression is a real thing. You know, they used to, you know, 100 years ago, just say, buck up, brush it off, keep on going. Of course, 100 years ago, they were working so hard they didn't have time to get depressed. But children today do, adults do. Because, well, I said this last week, parents are to put up fences, so to speak, rules, grounds, but, you know, we draw the lines that don't cross what they do. We all did it as children, didn't we? We crossed that line. Problem today is, parents will take a line from back here and just put it up there and say, no, don't cross that line. 50 years ago, you crossed the line, you were put back on the other side of the line, one way or another. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> as I said last week, People say, don't fence me in, don't put no rules, don't tell me I can't do this, I can't do that. We parents, we're to put rules down for our children, not to say you can't do, but to say we're trying to keep the bad out. You keep moving the line, and sooner or later, they're gonna be, the bad's gonna be inside the fence. It won't matter. The fences that just keep getting moved heard a story a long time ago about a boy who said, my parents loved me. They would not allow me to do anything that would hurt me. About the same time, parents were talking to their friends as the son had talked to his friends, and they said, well, we trust our son. He wouldn't do anything bad, so they were both kind of challenged. So the boy says, okay, I'll prove how much my parents love me. And he started drinking a little bit. He'd come home past his curfew, and parents say anything. We just got to trust him. Well, the boy keeps pushing the line and pushing the line. And the parents keep saying, we just got to trust him. He ends up getting in trouble. He does some shoplifting. He's in jail. His parents are called. They come down to the jail. They look at it. Their son sitting in the jail cell and says, son, why? And the son says, why didn't you stop me? They allowed that line to keep moving beforehand, they put him back. See, that's what peer pressure does. Sometimes it's too late. You can't go to the jail cell to see your child. You might go to the morgue. So why does Paul say, quoting, so that it may go be well with you? that you may live long on the earth. We may think our parents, or at some point think our parents didn't know better, but they've got more experience than any child or teenager or young adult. Maybe they tried what you're trying to do. Listen to them, obey them. Paul in Colossians kind of repeats it. There he tells the church of Colossae, children be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing. <laughs> And again, it's children, your parents, not all parents. Because some parents will lead children astray. Because the parents aren't walking with God. As adults, we need to kind of, all of us, step up a little. Maybe it's your children like mine are grown, you got grandchildren. Maybe it's your neighbor's children or your nephews and nieces that you can work with to say, look, here's the line, don't cross it. Let them know you love them. And that's why the line's there. But you know, the second goal goes to the parents. We are to instruct the children, others, about the Lord. Look at what he writes in verse number four. He says, fathers, now today would be more parents. In Paul's day, you know, fathers, we are to be the head of the household. But two are as, two are as one. 
So I would say, parents, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in a discipline and instruction of the Lord. The word discipline carries understanding of train them, be an example for them, instruct them. And I, I don't think I heard it growing up, but I know I had friends who did. And they would say, Mom, Dad, I want to go to a party. There'll be an adult there. My friend's 19-year-old brother's going to be there. Maybe some of you said that to your parents growing up. And as parents, we say, no, you can't go. Why not? Because I said so. Now, parents, if you ever said that, you probably said it because it's what you were told growing up. And it hurt you. It angered you just like it angered your child. If we tell a child because I say so, they don't understand. What we need to do is set them down and say, because I love you. I don't trust that 19 year old. I don't know all the friends that are gonna be at that party. You might be tempted to take a drink and could become intoxicated and could get hurt or drugs. And if it's a girl, you could get raped. You see, we just need to be honest with our children. Because I love you, that line's drawn, and I'm not going to let you cross it. Now, Ephesians 6, 4, in the message. Now, there's three ways that the Old and New Testament are translated. That's the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek from the original languages. As I've read, the New American Standard, King James, New King James, are a line or word-for-word translation. They find the word... Uh, in the English as closest to the word in those three original languages. Well, why don't they all read the same? Because language changes. We don't talk the way uh, today, in America in a way, like they did when the King James, well, you, I've seen a copy of the original King James. You, <laughs> you throw away your King James Bibles if they were written like that. Because we don't speak that way. We want to write the words the same. And, and even the King James you have has been updated a few times. The new King James is an update of the King James. But those are all word for word translations. Now, if you have a new international version, an NIV translation, that's a thought for thought. The authors of the NIV and other similar books, they look at it and say, well, here's what they're saying. Here's the thought. And then you have what's known as a paraphrase. An individual or group of people read the original languages and say, here's how I would write that if I was writing this. And so I think it's Peterson wrote the message. And for Ephesians 6, 4, he puts it this way. Fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Take them by the hand. Lead them in the way of the master. Here's what God's word says. Here's what, how we're supposed to respond or how we need to look at the situation of life. Not just what well, the world says, all my friends are going, so I want to go. We've got to teach them, instruct them, discipline, not necessarily take them to the woodshed, but to teach. That is why or how we are to be. Now, you ever have a story that you hear from years ago that sticks with you? I've got a story. It was on 60 Minutes. I don't think I was a teenager yet, so you're talking a long time ago, early 70s. But I heard this story. And every time I read this scripture, which is Deuteronomy 6, 7, Moses' last sermons, series of sermons, you might say, to the nation of Israel. And he's telling them, you shall teach them God's word and command. That's what they're to teach diligently to your sons, your children. Well, when you do it, you shall talk of them, God's word, God's command, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. So what Moses is instructing the Israelites to do, what we find in our God's word is, Teach your children about God and his word all the time. Well, the story I heard on 60 Minutes 
like I said, I believe this was in the early 70s. It was a couple out in, I think, California. They claimed to belong to a denomination. Mom belonged to one, father belonged to another. And they did not want their two boys saying God in the Cub Scout pledge. Well, you know, they introduced it. Why not? Well, we want our children, to, our boys, to grow up and decide for themselves whether they believe in God or not. <clears throat> that counters what Moses said. That counters what God's Word says. God's Word says, teach the children about him and about his word. But those parents were saying, and I even, I was a preteen, I realized it was wrong. What's wrong with our society? Parents aren't teaching about God and his word to their children. Listen, when you grow up, you'll decide. I could sit here and list at least a half a dozen or more belief systems that are vying for those child children's faith to go in them, including agnostic God's God is real, but He's not here. He doesn't do anything with us. And atheism, there is no God. Science follows atheism. Talked about this last week and on Wednesday. You know, the Bible says God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Science says billions of years to get where we are. But yet when you do some adding through the Bible, we're less than 7,000 years old. How do we get such a difference? The world, people, science, atheists, they want it their way. They want to put themselves first and God down at the bottom. We need to teach our children. We need to teach our grandchildren. We need to teach our nephews and nieces our neighbor's children, anybody we can. You know, I wish our numbers at VBS had been a lot higher. But we thank God for those we had. And let's plan for more next year and more the year after that. And that's why I sit up here this morning and say, we need children workers. We need youth workers. We need you to volunteer and say, here is what I think God wants me to do. So when the nominating calls you, they say, what's God needing you to do? You can go A, B, C, or at least A. And imagine what God will do through us because we're going to teach children. Goal number three, employees and employers submit to Christ. Employees and employers are to submit as to Christ. He says, verse number five. Now, we don't have slaves today, and I don't want to go there with the current society, but that's how it was in Paul's day. You people had slaves, and they had masters over their slaves. Well, today, that would be an employee. So I'm retired. We'll get to you. So employees, be obedient. Obey. Those who are your employer, masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of your heart as to Christ. What's Paul saying? If you're an employee, work for your employer as though your employer is Christ Jesus himself. He backs it up, verse 6. Not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as employees of Christ. Doing the will of God from the heart. So, work from the heart not, oh, the boss is looking, I have to work hard. Oh, the boss is gone, I can, you know, sit down and take a little break. I've worked with people like you. Verse 7, he says, with good, with good will, render service, as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether you are slave or free. You don't have to worry about those last words because it doesn't apply to our modern day. You're working. Maybe you've got the worst boss in the world. Maybe you've got the greatest boss in the world. But if you were working as though Jesus was your boss, as though Jesus signed your checks, 
you work any different? Would you like me to do? Because that's what Paul is saying. Now that's the employee. Verse 9 is addressed essentially to the employer. Masters, employers, do the same to them. Give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no partiality with him. You see, Jesus, God doesn't care if you're an employee or an employer or you're retired or you're just a housewife or, or whatever you might do in life. Doesn't matter to Jesus. Doesn't matter to God. We're all equal. God created man and woman in his image. Both are equal in his eyes. Just because you could be an employer and you're making a million dollars a year doesn't mean you're any better than the person that's making minimum wage. If you're the employer making a million dollars, you might think I'm better than that person but not in God's eyes. You're a human being. Therefore, employers, you work for the worst boss ever. You think he's Satan incarnate. In your mind, treat him as though he's Christ. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'll do this to the best of my ability. Now, if they tell you, I'm sorry you can't work on Sundays anymore, uh, you can't go to church anymore. You can't do anything. You can't pray to God, which a lot of businesses say. You can't pray out loud. You can't have a Bible. That's just time to think about finding another job or you stand up for Jesus. Now, if you're an employer or you're retired, I'm retired. I, I don't have to worry about all that. People are watching you. It might be a neighbor family member, you're being watched. Live your life as though Christ is who you're working for. Doesn't matter who it is. Just follow them. Now, as I prepared, I thought about Joseph, Jacob's favorite son, you know, coat of many colors. His brothers sold him as a slave. He ends up in Potiphar's house as a houseboy, you might say. But he worked as though God was his boss. God was with him. God blessed everything he did. He rises up. He's running the house. Until Potiphar's wife said, hey, good looking. And he ran doing the right thing because he knew to do what she wanted was a sin against God. He ends up in jail. He said, you know, most of us, God, why did we give up? Not Joseph. He said, well, God's with me. I'm going to work as though God is my boss. What happens? Jailer says, you know, he's such a good guy. I can trust him, though he's a prisoner, essentially. I'm going to put him in charge of this section of the jail. He ends up being in charge of Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker. They dream, have dreams. He interprets them. They come true. Two years go by. He's still working as though God is his boss. Pharaoh has a dream. Cupbearer says, here's this guy, this Hebrew. He comes before Pharaoh. He interprets the dream. He gives all the credit to God. Joseph ends up second command of all of Egypt. He saves his family. He saves the nation of Israel. Why? He didn't give up when he was in the pit. He didn't give up when he was in jail, when he was the, the beginning stage of being a houseboy in Potiphar's house. He says, I'm going to work so God is my boss. God raised him. Does that mean we should not try for promotions and so forth? No. But if you work as though, I believe, God is your boss, you don't have to try for the promotions. They'll come to you. If you're running a business and you treat your employers as though they were Jesus Christ themselves, not bow down and worship them, but treat them right. They'll work for you. They'll give you everything. 
because you're treating them wrong. I've known some bosses. I remember one boss, Paul and I both worked for him. I learned quickly when he walked in, if he spoke to you, you could speak to him. If he didn't speak to you, you stayed away from him. Maybe if I had worked better like a, uh, I was working for Christ, it would have been a hard stretch in my mind, but either way, if I could have worked for him, maybe his life would have changed. So, how would you live your life? Retired, working, employer, employee? If you knew Jesus was physically watching you. Think about that for a minute. How would you live your life? Would it be any different? You get up, dress, breakfast, go off to work, or stay at home. And as you're driving to work, or you're sitting there eating your breakfast across from you, beside you, Jesus, if you would say, would you say everything you normally say? Would you do everything you normally do? Or would you change something? Because what Paul is saying, children, parents, adults, submit your life to Christ and nobody else. Don't listen to the world. They'll tell you otherwise or follow him. So, as Christians, we can accomplish these. Number one, children can obey their parents. But only if two parents who can instruct children and others about the Lord. Teach them about God. Teach them about his word. And third, employees and employers can work, live, submitting as to Christ. I do not know the fine details of anyone's life. If you placed your faith in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, then you know you're saved and you're going to enter into heaven one day. Therefore, you are to submit to Christ in every area of your life, not just church life, but every area of your life. Wives are to fo uh, follow the will of your husband. Husbands are to put the needs of your wife before your needs. Children, obey your parents. You'll live long. Parents, instruct your children about the Lord, about his word. And as an adult, live your life to please God in all areas. To do this is to consistently live a life that's worthy of you being called a Christ follower. Living this way is the way to live God's way and it brings unity to the church. You'll be walking in the light. You'll be shining the light of Christ in your life and ranking under him. God Christ, husband, wife, children. This is what messes us up. This is what Satan wants, is for us to not line up with Christ. Remember God, the Father, God, the Son? There are two but one. Why are you supposed to be the wife and the husband? Two for one. The children, we need to raise them up in that same manner. So that when they get married, they're two but one. One husband, one wife, raising their children to do the same thing. But Satan is alive and well and wants to deceive us into thinking we don't have to live that way. There was a point in my life. I was a church member, but I wasn't going to church. I worked night shift, 40 hours a week. I loved it. it allowed me time. I could come home, take a nap, get up, go with my children, or, or do something and go to bed later on. I'd go in on Sunday nights, work from 7 to midnight or so, when we changed our prices and sales and so forth. And then I learned to be a cashier. And I got to work on Sundays. Now, Saturday night was overtime, time and a half. Sundays was double time. It was a union job. I convinced myself I was doing all this for my family. But 
and our son went forward and got saved. And I realized I wasn't living a Christian life. The world had convinced me I'm doing what needs to be done, but I was really miserable in my life because I wasn't walking with God. And after our son went forward, I thought, God really spoke to me and said, he's going to follow daddy's example. I didn't like the example I was setting. And I had to make changes. And I was the ordained deacon in the church at that time. The pastor we had, I said, oh, I don't like him. He's too nosy. Make like that about me. <laughs> so I had to change. I had to get myself right with God. I had to get into his word. I had to read it. I had to seek to understand it. And I had to say, yes, God, not my will, but yours be done. Look where it got me. I wouldn't be anywhere else. That doesn't mean everybody's going to become a preacher, so to speak. Maybe God's saying, I want you to be a Sunday school teacher. I want you to start a prayer circle. I want you to go on a mission trip. I want you to do this, or I want you to do that. I want you to be a, become a prayer warrior for this church. It's when we submit ourselves under the authority of Christ all the time and live his way. When I accepted Christ, I said I went forward, one, please, my parents, and two, safety in numbers. I had about four or five of my friends going forward at the same time. I was sitting in the car with my parents. After that, it was a revival service. So it was at nighttime. I'm sitting there, and God said, following Christ is the better way. I'm here as a testimony. I've lived my life not following. And I live my life now following him. Yeah, I fall short a lot, but I can get back up with his help and keep on going forward. Which one's the better way of life? Following Christ. You're here this morning and you're not following him. You drifted as I drifted from him. You can make a change. You can join the church. You can rededicate your life. You can do whatever God leads. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And we pray as we prepare ourselves to hear God's word. A little small whisper and then follow his lead. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you. Lord, yes, we fall short. And for some of us, maybe we've used that as an excuse to, to not serve you in whatever capacity you want us to. We've just said, we're not worthy. I'm going to mess it up. Lord, remove that thought from all of our minds this very moment. May everyone who hears this online or here in this building say, how can I serve you, God? How can I line my life up with you and stay as close to that line as I possibly can? How can I help me to recognize when Satan is tempting me, trying to pull me away? I don't want to be there, Father, because the best life is when I'm following you. Doesn't mean we'll have all high mountain top highs. We're going to have some valley lows, but we will never be alone as long as we submit to the authority of Christ. You know the hearts and souls and every detail of all of our lives, God. One person in this room. If one person who watches this online needs to make a change in their life, may the ones here come forward and those online contact me and say, I need to change. I need Christ. To be in my life or strong. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing Standing on the Promises, which, by the way, is my favorite hymn. <laughs> when I was growing up, my, both my parents were in the choir, and the way that church was set up, the choir was over here, and they were not elevated. And so I sat right there. So they keep an eye on And we sang this hymn a number of times in the words of the second and fourth. And we're going to sing one, two, and four, by the way. I'm not 
know, the board was just for you. That's my fault. Those words just got to me. If you had your info opened up, it's 225. It says, standing on the promises that cannot fail. As a child, that, that just hit me. It cannot fail. God's promises. Promises that if I believe in him, I'll, I'll be saved. I'll go to heaven. Promises that he's always with me. They're never going to fail. And then the fourth line, it says, standing on the promises, I cannot fall. I just told you, we're going to fall short. But if you stand on God's word, you stand on God's promises, you might stumble, but God will catch you and you will not fall. That's what this says, tells me. That's why we need to stand on God's promises. What's that? Anything from Genesis to Revelation. Stand on his word. They won't fail. You won't fall. Same in response as God would have.